Hey, ladies and gentlemen, what is going on? Welcome back. This is Force here with some more Magic Duels Origins. In today's video, I'm going to take you through some story mode gameplay. Uh, there are five Planeswalker stories to take place here. There is Gideon, Jace, Liliana, Chandra, and Nisa. And I think I'm actually going to take you through Nisa's story. Now, you might be saying, Force, are you spoiling the story for us? That looks like the last one. Uh, these aren't interconnected. And basically all the story mode is, it's it's essentially just like a backdrop for having duels take place. And as you go through the story, you unlock progressively more gold. I think I haven't done Lil Liliana, I believe, so just to show you, yeah, it goes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And it's just, it's just basically a way to introduce people to the game, give them some duels without playing against real opponents, or without throwing them into a mode where they just have to build their own decks right away. So I just thought it'd be interesting to show you some of this gameplay. So let's go ahead and play through uh, Nisa's campaign here. Uh, starting off uh, with the basic introduction, we'll get that when we hit start here. So you have reoccurring visions that leave you with an unshakable feeling that there's a darkness hunting you. In an attempt to protect your tribe from whatever is after you, you flee Joraga territory. Not far outside the safety of the forest, you detect the unmistakable scent of vampires. Yes, vampires are hunting our poor Nisa. Let's see what we can do to fend them off. Nisa's not poor, by the way. Nisa is very, very well equipped to handle pretty much anything. Wow, I'm going to stick with this hand. Because we've got two, uh, three two threes to start off with and the two mana to play them. So we will absolutely keep it. So yeah, to, all this is, again, it's like a, it's just a backdrop to, to have some basic uh, games for, for beginners to play. And it tells a little story, which is nice if you're interested in that. Uh, if I get 10 life or less, this gets plus two, plus one, which becomes very scary. Uh, so yeah, that's nice. Now, another thing worth noting is, look at this. We only start off with 40 cards. The reason that is is because the deck starts off incredibly simplistic with only a few basic creatures, but then gets more complex with more cards added as you progress through the story mode. So again, like I mentioned, trying to sort of ease people into the game, they're starting off with just some pretty basic stuffs. Here's a 2-3, you know, shuffles in your library when you die, but then we're going to get better enchantments, pump-ups, things like that as time goes on. He's going to play Child of Night, a 2-1 a lifelink vampire. Big danger if I get below... Uh, 10 health uh, because I'm pretty sure he's got a bunch of those vampires that get uh, pumped up when I reach that state So hopefully we get into some life game. I believe there's a, a grazing glade heart in the deck so Here's our niece's chosen. It's a 2-3 uh, if niece is chosen would be put into the uh, Graveyard or rather if it dies you instead get to shuffle it into your library So it just keeps coming back unless it gets exiled essentially So he's not gonna attack because I've got this big beefy 2-3 body and I'm gonna keep getting more and more of those which has me feeling pretty good. We also have the Hitchclaw Recluse, which is a uh, creature with reach. You know, I, um... Don't play the... Should we play the Recluse? It's a 1-4. Or the 2-3. Um... Let's play the Recluse right now. I'll tell you why, because if I draw into a mana, I can play both Nisa's Chosen's next turn for 4. So I kind of like that. We also have the Wild Instinct, uh, Instincts, which forces two creatures to fight, but pumps up your creature as well. So it's like a Prey Upon plus give your creature plus two plus two. Although it doesn't seem like two value, because Prey Upon costs one and Giant Growth costs one, but Giant Growth gives a creature plus three plus three. So for a single card, you get it costs twice as much, and it doesn't even give as much pump up. It's kind of a bummer, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like this should cost three. Not, let me just say that. Ruthless Callblade, 2-1. He gets plus two, plus one when I have ten or uh, less life. So it's basically uh, the same thing as the Ghoul Draz Vampire, uh, but with one extra attack for one extra mana. All right, I'm hoping for that land. There it is. This is perfect, because that means two times Nisa's Chosen. Now, we could go with the Wild Instincts and um, force two creatures to fight, but there's nothing right here that I necessarily want to blow up at the moment. I'm going to wait until maybe he drops something a little more powerful. And I'm going to keep a, a defensive stance here because of the fact that if I attack, that leaves me open to attacks from him, which lowers my life, which gets him closer to getting these guys pumped up. I don't like that one bit. All right, so this is it. He has dumped his hand. The vampires are all there. They're there, and they said, hey, this is me. What are you going to do about me? And I'm going to say, well, actually... I think um, I think we're going to be in a very good position here. So we'll probably start attacking pretty soon. 
In fact, why don't I just start attacking now? Why don't we swing with those? I will keep the 1-4 though, but we will attack with the 2-3s because if he double blocks stuff, both of his things will die. So he triple blocks this, that means only um, two of his will die. He's gonna gain six life, uh, but he's gonna lose two of his Child of the Knights. The other ones are gonna go through. So he gains six, but loses four. So he only gains two, as you can see, bringing up to 22. Let's see if he swings with everything here. No, he does not. And then he plays 3-1. Uh, he can tap eight, have a player lose life, and have him gain life. Now, he's nowhere near having eight, but I don't like that three attack, so I might go with a fight here so that I can uh, kill that. Um, so let's actually do that now. I don't like that three attack, so we're gonna pump him up, have him fight him, and this is a 3-3 three, three now, and I'm actually comfortable with swinging with everything here. Yeah, because we've got much more power than he has. Four, three, and then two, two, twos. He's gonna let it all go through, so he's what he's gonna try to do is he's gonna try to race me down. He doesn't have enough damage to get me low enough to pump these up yet, though, so I feel okay. But he's gonna be able to do two, four, six. Uh, chooses just to attack for the six. He gains two health with that, but he's a little low too. Now I just have to worry about his pump up. That's the big thing. I have to worry about his pump up. So what I can do, well, let's see what I have. He blocks four, he takes two, three, four, five. It's not quite enough, but we do have one blocker still. Shucks, I almost feel like I have to go with a defensive position. No, I think I'll be fine. Well, he's gonna get me too low if I attack with everything. So let's actually just attack with these. This saves us with two blockers, which means he doesn't get us below 10 with his current board. He's gonna lose this creature right now. So he takes four. We, he, he can only do two damage to us right now. And if he, if, he, if he goes for that, he loses two of his creatures as well, which is not a good situation for him. All right, plays his black mana source. There you go. All right, so I believe I think I just attack with everything here. Let's save him as a blocker, though. There we go. Attack with all those, save him as a blocker. He can't let it all go through. He has to block. He blocks. He loses everything. We keep everything. And that should pretty much be the first game. That should pretty much be defeat for the uh, poor, poor vampires. When this creature attacks, each opponent loses one life. And a lot of these uh, cards also appear to be unique just to the story mode. Um, it seems like there's a lot of the stuff that actually isn't in the... Isn't in the main uh, pool of cards, essentially. At least I believe so. He's going to block the 4-4. Takes the rest, and the Vampire Stalkers have been defeated. Though you repressed your elemental powers around the Joraga, now you let them flow. The Stalking Vampire will not bother you again. As your connection with the land deepens, you begin to understand that the darkness is not haunting you. It's calling you. There's a blight deep in the continent of Akorium. That is where you must go. Oh, those vampires, they don't know what's coming. Okay, so we defeated the vampires. Now... We make our way closer to the mountain. As you draw closer to the mountains of the Akoam, you can feel the land churn with the raw magic of the plane. This is the royal, the manifestation of Zendikar's wild mana. Before you can react, you are caught up in it. I like how they uh, animate this stuff. They make it move a little bit. Uh, it's nice. It's a nice touch. Uh, so as you can see, we've got a couple more cards than we did last time. Sitting with 38 right now. Uh, this is an okay opening hand. We've got land acceleration and the two nieces chosen. So we'll go ahead and keep this. We do get to play first as well. So yes, uh, the decks get more complex as time goes on. We get additional cards added to them, going from 40 cards to, I guess, whatever 38 plus 7 is. <laughs> 45. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Zeneca, what? All right, so it's a blue deck. He starts off by putting a wind Zeneca on his land, which makes it a 2-2 flyer. I can't even do anything about that right now. I believe the deck does have creatures with reach, but I have to draw into it. Um, I'm happy with Anissa's Pilgrimage, though. That's going to accelerate us, letting us get the Charging Rhino out faster. So we can tap this as a land or just attack with it. Looks like he's choosing to attack with it. Let's see if he's got another one of those freaking Wind Zendikons to put on his other land. I am just going to be eternally miffed. 
Please tell me you do not. Okay, he doesn't. All right, we're going to go with the acceleration right now. Uh, this is going to let us play our Charging Rhino next turn. So we got two lands. If we had if we had an, uh, two instant sorceries, sorceries in our graveyard, we would have gotten three lands instead. But I'm not going to wait around for it. The deck doesn't have a lot of instant or sorceries in it, especially now since it's still a small deck. All right, so we go for two for two. Um, really, I'm just hoping that if I can land this Charging Rhino, it should be pretty awesome. He's going to attack for two in the air. I wonder if he's going to do anything with his two mana. Yes, he does. Plays a 1-2. If he paid the kicker, which he doesn't, it's a lot, he gets a tap three permanence. Uh, has to pay kicker five for that. Clearly doesn't have five mana sitting around right now. So this is pretty good. Oh my gosh, there's a little too many lands, though. Charging Rhino, so we get a 4-4 in play. Can't be blocked by more than one creature. So a lot of times people will uh, double, triple block large creatures. He can't do that against the Charging Rhino. So we attack for two. Probably going to let it go through. Because I'm sure he values his 1-2 flyer more than taking two damage. At least at this stage in the game. Later on it might be a different story. But I mean he could also just save it to block that 4-4. He's going to play another Winds Endicon. Giving him another 2-2 two -two flyer as a land. Plays another land. That uh, that card really sucks. I mean, it's good, but it sucks for me. And attacks for two, four, uh, five damage total, which I can't do anything about. So that goes through, bringing me down, down, down. I just have to do something. Oh, this is this is pretty good. So the Zendikon, uh, if Enchanted Land dies, return that card to its owner's hand. But we get rid of the creature aspect of it, and we get to do more damage this turn. Yeah, there's absolutely no reason for me not to do this right now. Um, so I'm going to force a fight. Pump him up. Kill the land. Okay, so we're also going to deal 8 damage this turn now. Um, the land, it does go back to his hand, but it doesn't matter at this point. Next turn, he'll get to replay it, but right now, he has tapped out. He's taking 8 damage, plus he's got 2 less damage to swing for us in the upcoming turn. So I get a feeling... He's going to be saving uh, his land for blockers coming up because he's getting dangerously low. In fact, we're going to have uh, we're going to have Fatal right here in play. Four, five, six, seven, eight. So he needs to save for blockers. Uh, a little bit bummed out that we've drawn as much mana as we have. And he plays a 4-4 four, four flying. It also forces him to return a land to his hand or sacrifice a living tsunami. Um, oh my goodness. Are you serious? That was the top deck of all top decks. So we're going to do this. Plus two, plus two. Force them to fight. So he is now a 6-2. Now, obviously, the 6-2 is blocked. But had I done this to one of my 2-3s, the 2-3 would have been a 1 health, and he would have blocked with the 1-2 and killed it. So this prevents a creature from dying while still pushing through 4 damage. It's uh, 2 potential less damage, but I think it's worth ha saving the creature for 2 potential less damage for the turn. And plays a Tempest Owl, another one without kicker, so it's just going to be a 1-2 blocker. So now he's got two blockers available. And, uh-oh, can't be blocked. Enters the battlefield with uh, two 1-1 one -one counters if it was kicked. I, it was not kicked, though, so it was just a blocker. So now he's got two chump blockers. Uh, will not kill any of my creatures. Wow, nice. That's a trample giver. All right, so let's attack first. He will block two, take two, bringing him down to two. None of my creatures die. Both of his do. Uh, we don't even need to play the Invoker. I should, in case he gets a bunch of small creatures in play. Uh, the Invoker will let me give a creature plus five, plus five, and trample. Which will be hilarious. I believe I yeah, I do have the mana to activate that as well. And uh, given that the AI is attacking, they usually throw like this if there is literally no possible way for them to win and they realize it they'll just basically just throw the game so let's go ahead and do this let's put it on something that's not our 4-4 that way if he bounces it back we got something else again none of this really matters though because we swing for way more damage than we need to defeat the royal all right let's see continuation of the story 
As the royal subsides, the land before you coalesces into an earthen beast-like form. The elemental approaches you with its head low, and you know that it is an ally. You form a bond with it, and you sense that it will guide you the rest of the way to a koem. Here we go, going to a koem. Your journey into the mountains becomes harder with each step. As you approach a towering peak, the darkness grows into something almost tangible. The land tells you this is the source of the blight. You reach out to it, and suddenly your mind is overwhelmed by otherworldly visions of an ancient horror. These are the Eldorazi. Here are Nisa's visions. Your vision shows you strange beings attacking. Survive their assault to see the source of the corruption. The Eldrazi behemoth M. Rakul. So all I need to do is survive. He's got 100 health. I'm not going to chip through that. This is all about just living. And something like the Grazing Glade Heart helps me just live. Because I can do Glade Heart, land into Invoker, which gives me a blocker. The Behemoth is, or the Balath is a long way away from being played, but the uh, the Grazing Glade Heart is enough of a reason to keep this hand. So this is a fun little encounter. Uh, it's 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 different from a normal match, obviously, with him having 100 life, and and my win condition is again quite literally just survive. You can see we went up to 50 cards this time. Wow, drawing the two drop is the dream. It is absolutely the dream. And now it's worth noting that my hands and the outcome of the games are not predetermined. Because we can draw new hands and look for different things. There's, there's there's multiple ways any game can go. It's like a regular game of magic, just with, you know, you, you got it. You got. It. I don't need to explain this to you. Alright, we're going to play the Grace and Glade Heart right away. I'm really happy that he's off to a slow start. No turn to drop. Is very good for my chances of surviving. I don't even know why I'm attacking, because again, it's not. <laughs> it, it it's not about chipping away his health. It's about surviving until he plays his monstrous creature. But again, a bit of a slow start. So let's see if uh, he gets this cracking right now. Really? I'm a big. This goes to show you. This is going much differently from the game that I played before. I suppose I should just keep swinging. Is if he's not playing anything, I might as well try to deal damage to him. Okay, here's four lands. He must. He must. There it is, finally. Okay. So this is the premise of this uh, this matchup here. He's got these uh, Kozilex, Kozilex, and uh, they're Eldrazi drones that put... 01 colorless Eldrazi spawns into play that can be sacrificed for mana. So he sort of keeps rolling this, gets more and more colorless ones in play until he can just produce a ton of mana out of nowhere and, and plot this huge creature in play. Um, I feel like though we have gotten such a strong start, he might never get it in play. I'm almost concerned that I shouldn't attack. Like, I'm literally half thinking... Well, if I don't attack, well, I, actually, I don't want to attack anyways right now. To be honest with you. I don't want to sacrifice this or any of these guys. He's got a 3-3. The chump blockers are obviously whatever, but I wouldn't want to sacrifice any of those creatures. So, yeah, I think we're just going straight up defensive stance uh, from this point forward. So, here we go. Plays the uh, Predator. Gets two more of those in play. So now he's got access to four, um, eight, nine mana. Plays a flame slash. He's going to burn my four, three. Well, it's better than him burning that, to be honest. There is a rhino. Play it for defensive purposes and pass the turn. It just doesn't, it literally makes zero sense to attack. I, I, not only is it not the goal of this match, but there's no way in hell I'd ever work through that much life. So doing anything but defensive stance. Alright, so here's another Eldrazi drone. Produces three of them. So now he's got access to five, six, ten, thirteen mana. Game board pulls back. I don't know if you guys have seen that yet, but uh, yeah, this is what happens when a large number of creatures have come into play. We can play the Woodcrasher. Gets a plus four, plus four, and trampled till end of turn whenever I play a land. Again, doesn't matter. Because <laughs> I'm not attacking. 
All right, so I think he's got access to enough mana now. If not, he will next turn. This should definitely be the mana that he needs to play his behemoth. No, not yet. Plays a Growth Spasm, three land, search library for a basic card, put it in the battlefield, tapped, and then put an 0-1 color into the battlefield. Okay, so he gets a land, plus another one of his Eldrazi. I'm assuming next turn. I think he needs 15 mana to cast whatever it is. Let's gain two life. I'm gonna be honest with you, this is a lot easier than the first time that I did it, um, because the first time that I did it, should I just attack with my 8-8 Trample? I think it's just gonna, I'm not, I don't wanna do it because it's just gonna prolong this match, because if he blocks with his 0-1s, there it is. Okay, so he finally plays it. Ah, oh, I wanted to zoom in and show it to you. It's a ridiculous card. It's a, it's just ridiculous. I guess that's all you need to know. <laughs> oh, let me be the, be the battlefield. There we go. Look at this thing. Emrakul, a 15-15. Can't be countered. Take an extra turn after this one when it is cast. Flying protection from colored spells. Annihilator 6, which means when you attack your opponent, they have to sacrifice 6 permanents. And you take an extra turn after you play it, so that's gonna guarantee to happen. And if it's put in the graveyard from anywhere, shuffled in your library, the card is ridiculous. That's all I gotta say. Card is ridiculous, but we survived. You've seen it too much. The power of the entity hibernating within the land threatens to drive you mad. You scream, clinging desperately to sanity. Around you, the mountain, the horror within it, and Zendikar itself all begin to fade away. Your first planeswalk brings you to Lorwyn. You can't shake the image of the horror in the mountain. You encounter an elf named Dwynin who tells you their home is threatened. Inspired to help defend your elvish cousins, you join them on a hunt. So me and the elves are gonna hunt the Bogart tribe. Oh, silly Bogarts. 48 cards in deck, seven in hand. So now we're bumped up to four. So you see it gets progressively, it goes from 40 up to 60 card deck is uh, essentially how it works. Um, I'm not too keen on this hand, so we're gonna draw a new one. Further evidence that this is not like predetermined outcomes. All right, perfect. That's a nice curve actually, if we draw two more lands. And we get to play second, so. All right, he reveals a Goblin Fire Slinger for the sake of playing this untapped. He then likely taps it and plays a Goblin Fire Slinger. That's a really nice combo. If you get a lot of one drops, doesn't even matter that you're revealing it if you're about to play it anyways. Fire Slinger can tap, uh, tap itself to deal one damage to me. That is not the land that we want and so desperately desire. We really need to draw a land. Please don't mana screw me. I I've got a beautiful curve. If you mana screw me, I'll be a sad panda. No reason for him to attack with this. He can just tap it at the end of turn. Plays a 2-1. Sacrifice a goblin. Put two 2-1 two black goblin rogue tokens onto the battlefield, that is really good. You sacrifice one goblin to get an additional goblin. Because you get, it's one for two. Um, that's pretty darn good. There's a land, perfect, so that gives us the three. Now I've got two more turns to draw one more land. Three more turns to draw. Yeah, even actually, even if we only draw one more land in the next two turns, playing both of these back to back, plus having the wild instincts is pretty good. Uh, likely we'll use the wild instincts on this guy. Because I don't want him to fill his board with a bunch of one one blockers. We don't have a ton of charge in this deck, and I'm gonna need a lot more mana to be able to uh, trigger that invoker. All right, when it dies, deal three damage to our creature or player. That sucks. That sucks. Hmm. Oh, perfect, 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 perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. We got the lands, we got the lands going. I think I attack with the two, three. He pro he's probably not gonna block. Yeah, it doesn't. Um, if he attacks with this, I won't block it, because I don't want it to die and then kill that. That is uh, annoying, the Mud Button Torch Runner. Man, oh man, a black, black red goblin deck has me running scared. Gonna start to get our big creatures in play soon, though. Oh gosh, another one of those. So he's gonna start sacrificing them with this and pinging stuff off. I can prevent that from happening though with a Wild Instincts. And I think I will do that. I think I'm gonna Wild Instincts. 
I think I'm gonna wild instincts to kill that so that he can't sacrifice these to ping stuff off. Like he'd be able to ping this off because it's only got three health. Question is, who do I uh, pump up and do I attack with him? I think I pump up this one. We're gonna kill that so we can't, next turn he can start doing the sacrificing. Um, and it's got four health, so I could attack with it. If I attack with both of the, if I attack with this, he could triple block, he could kill all my creatures, but he's also out of stuff too. So if he wants to kill my things, that's actually fine. Um, if he wants to throw his stuff away to kill my guys, that's actually fine. Maybe I should kill both of them. That way he can't use this on a... F I don't want him to use these guys on my future creatures. That's what I don't want to happen. Oh, he's going to do some of that damage to my face? Are you serious? Dude, you totally should have killed this guy. What are you doing? Oh, no, oh, I know. He's trying to zerg me down. But does he have the necessary tools? He might. Yeah, it's interesting that he's doing this on his turn. Saving one blocker, I see. Oh, this just helps me not lose the game right there. Yeah, I think he had a chance, but um, the Grazing Glade Heart gives me a tremendous advantage. Now I will gain two life whenever I play land. And even just gaining that two life that single time right there could be more than enough to have me uh, secure a victory. Now I could play the Invoker next turn, but I'd much rather play the Rhino because I can't trigger the Invoker anyways. Uh, Tarfighter is two damage to a creature player, so that is shock, basically. It's a tribal instant though. So it counts as a counts as a tribal ability. It's a, it's a really funny uh, picture. <laughs> I really like that. Uh, I think I'm still fine, though. All right, yeah, he just drew into a land. So I believe we are more than well prepared here. We only have six men. Um, yeah, let's play this guy. He's got more health. He can't be double blocked. It's a good play. We attack for one. He doesn't block and pings us for two. But he might block the 4-4 next turn. But he, he can block and ping me. Which is what he'll probably do. So he's got 2-4 damage. And 5. Uh, it's going to be tough. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I have to try to outpace him. It's actually... He could still win here. Depending on what sort of stuff he top decks. He could still win. Very strange decision. By that AI. Target creature gets a minus two, minus two till end of turn. When when this creature dies, so it's a blocking creature. You can block that, then give it minus two, minus two. Um, well, whatever. I need to I need to make plays here. I can't I can't just sit around. So he is gonna block and kill this guy, and probably just let the one go through. What? Um, okay. I'm actually very concerned right now. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm still very concerned right now. If I draw another mana, I, I win. That's not it. I think I'm fine, though. I think. <laughs> Depending on what he draws next turn. Alright, let's attack with everything. I would expect him let the one go through. Block this, maybe? Yeah, and then he can tap that and still ping me. There we go. And with the 2-2, two -two, he can kill the 4-4, four -four, which is what he should have done last turn. So it dies, deals 2 damage, then it... Okay, chooses to kill the 4-3. Listen, no one ever accused the uh, Bogarts of being smart. So I guess we shouldn't be too surprised. I'm just lucky he didn't top deck an additional four damage because he totally would have won. Lucky for me, this just happened. Doesn't really matter who we put it on. Let's put it on our lowest attack minion. <laughs> Give him plus five, plus five and trample. Swing for the win. Blocks four, pings us for one, takes six, 10, 12. The Bogart tribe have been defeated.
To your horror, the hunting party massacres a group of Bogarts. You're appalled at the murder of these innocent creatures. Dwynen claims that the Bogarts' hideousness is reason enough for the slaughter. You will not abide such evil. You intervene on the Bogarts' behalf, and Dwynen and her elves quickly turn on you as they chase you through the woods. You feel a connection to this new land forming. You call on both your elemental powers and your skills as the Joraga warrior. These elves don't know what they're in for. All right, Dwynen, you don't know what you're in for. We literally just said that. All right, so here we are now up to 60 card deck. That is a pretty awful hand. That's uh, interesting. I haven't seen that book. Search library for X space. Yeah, it's nice. That's pretty nice, but that this is a pretty terrible hand. So we're going to draw a new one. Wow. Okay. I'll keep this. I we I, I know we went down to six, but at least we got the two nieces chosen. Further evidence that uh, not pre-scripted matches here. You get what you get, and you play with it. Happy to finally be up to a 60-card deck, though. Got some more interesting stuff in here. Love the Battle of Wood Crusher. Pretty cool card. If only it costs one less to cast, huh? All right, so this is going to be against a green elven deck with some black splashed in because they're evil, obviously. 2-2, two, two, enters the battlefield. If you control an elf, put a 1-1 one, one elf into play. He does not control an elf, so he doesn't get to do that. But he does have a 2-2. Two, two. His 2-2 two, two does not survive our 2-3, though. I'm going to play another Nisa's Chosen. Love this guy. Show him in a second. For now, though, we swing for two. Two goes through. All right, so this is the Dauntless Dower Bark. It has power and toughness equal to the number of forests, as well as tree folk that you control. So when I put him into play, he, 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 yeah, he gets pumped up. There you go. That's how it works. Gets pumped up for forests, gets pumped up for tree folk. Now, he himself is also a tree folk. I'm not sure how many tree folk this thing has in it anyways. 2-2, two, two. enter the battlefield, search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it in your hand. So I don't know besides this guy how many other tree folk are being run in the deck. I'm really unsure. Oh nice, we drew into that. Um, kind of a bummer though, it's gonna be a very long time till we can play. Let's play the Dauntless Dower Bark. It's a 5-5, five, five, so it gets uh, pumped up for the lands plus himself. We will attack with both. There's a decent chance he will double block one of them. He does. Who do we want to kill? Let's kill this one in case he bounces it back to his hand. Okay. And the two goes through. One of his lives, one of his dies. 5-5 five, five just gets bigger as we play more lands. Destroy target non-elf creature. Never mind. Say goodbye to the 5-5. Five, five. Well. It's fun while it lasted. He swings for two. Interesting. So he's going to open me up to swing. A uh, big problem for me, though, is I've got nothing to play next turn. Even if I draw a land, I can't play a thing. Ooh, that's nice. Do we use that to kill this 2-2? Two, two? I might want to wait. Yeah, I don't know that he's someone that I want to kill. So I'm going to hold off on the wild instincts. I think I'd rather save it until he plays something maybe a little bigger, a little more threatening. I mean, it would be getting rid of a blocker. It would have also done two more damage for the turn, but... The only thing that stinks is it's not an instant, so I can't do it now and then also play something if I, like, drew a 4-drop next turn, you know what I mean? That is definitely a uh, negative side effect here. 1-1, one, one, search library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it in your hand, okay. So he's just getting more and more lands. 2-2, hmm. two, two, enters the battlefield, target creature your opponent controls gets minus, okay. So I think I'm gonna kill that and then attack and he'll probably block. I need to start thinning up some of those numbers here. He's got a bit too much going on. We don't have any instant sorceries. We could have one, but we're not gonna have two anytime soon. Oh, you know what I can do actually? Let's wild instincts, pump him up to a three, five, kill that one. And then we attack with this guy. Maybe he, uh, maybe he blocks, excuse me, a four, five. Maybe he blocks with both. If he does, we clear his entire board. 
He just chooses to block with one. Okay. That's fine. I get rid of two creatures either way. So I think that works. If I just attacked with the 2-3 itself, he would have double blocked and only would have lost his 2-2. Two, two. But the way I did it, he ended up losing uh, two creatures instead of one. We're going to have to pledge this turn. Yeah, we have to do it anyways. So this gives us the um, six to play this next turn. And we'll be sitting on an extra land in our hand that we might actually not play so that we can guarantee trigger his landfall the t following turn. Unless we draw into a land, then I will play one of the two. Yeah, I don't really need to though. This is so crazy. I mean, you, you thin out your deck so much with this. It does cost a ton, but boy oh boy do you thin out your deck. Uh, exile enough card from your graveyard. Scarred Vine Breeder gets plus three plus three till end of turn. He can do that one time. He's only got one black source right now. Okay, so I will play one of them. And we will play the Behemoth. Oh, wait a second. Oh my god. There's no... Is that how that works? Will I get plus four plus four and trample for each land that comes into play off of Boundless Realms? Holy crap, that would be insane. I'm not going to attack with a 2-3. Holy crap, that would be insane. Please don't have the thing that destroys a non-elf. Please don't have the thing that destroys a non-elf. What is this? Uh, Imperious Perfect. Elves get plus one plus one. Put an elf token into play. That's fine. Please don't do the thing that destroys a non-elf. Please, 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 please. I don't think he has it. I am pretty sure that this guy triggers off of every land that comes into play. So, bal oh, oh my gosh. Um, I will block with this. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. There's no, is it, I think it, I really think it is. I really think it is. I really, really think that this is about to happen. Um, do I still have enough? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, I will. I'm going to play the scoop mob too, just for its and giggles. Um, wait, wait one second. Here we go. You guys ready for this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Put them into play tapped. <laughs> oh, if he had, if he doesn't have removal. This is the most hilarious thing I've ever seen. Yeah, whatever, bro. Pretty sure that's not enough. Because he's got Trample too. Dwinen defeated. Nisa wins. Huh? Oh no, what's going on? So, so this is a... Uh, this is a... It's a end of story cinematic. I can't say I'm blown away by the visuals here, but I guess at least they put the effort into doing something. She's filled with Nisa's rage. Turns her vine into a sword. But the woodland creatures do not like such violence. And Nisa says, you may live for today. But if you, if you so much as throw your... Yeah, that's right. That's right. Throw your sword away. Because I'll come back and whoop your ass with the power of the vines. All right, guys. Thanks so much for watching. hope you enjoyed uh, going through the story mode. Checking out Nisa's story. There's uh, four other Planeswalkers for you to experience yourself. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you have a great afternoon. And I'll see you later.